From the moment a child is born, a parent's primary concern becomes keeping their child safe. It's an innate instinct that compels parents to go to any lengths to really shield their child from any sort of harm. It can be difficult to understand how some parents either lack these instincts entirely or have somehow lost them along the way. Good parents are willing to sacrifice their own comfort, their own safety, and even their lives to ensure their child's well-being. So when we hear stories in the news about parents doing the complete opposite or about people who caused harm to their own children or failed to keep them safe, it challenges our fundamental idea of what it means to be a loving parent. Now, in the past, we have discussed the case of 12-year-old Madalena Kojikari, whose parents didn't report her as missing until 22 days after she disappeared. She has now been missing since late November of 2022, after last being seen publicly getting off of a school bus. Her mother, Diana Kojikari, and her stepfather, Christopher Palmetter, were arrested for failing to notify police. And eight months later, they are still refusing to cooperate with investigators. Unfortunately, though, so far, search and investigation efforts have not led to finding Madalena. And recently, the Mecklenburg Court in North Carolina unsealed a lot of documents, giving more information and insight into this investigation. So with this new information, I'm going to go over some new additions to the timeline of events and several pieces of evidence that detectives have found. There has also been a very interesting interview with a woman who was close to Madalena and her family, and she helps us understand who Madalena is as a person and the dynamic between Christopher and Diana. Initially, it seemed like Diana may have been withholding information in an attempt to keep Madalena safe. However, many people are starting to doubt Diana's intentions and believe that she may have had a bigger hand in her daughter's disappearance than originally thought. So let's get into the updates and hopefully we will have a better idea of what actually happened to Madalena. Hey guys, I'm Annie Elise. This is 10 to Life. Let's jump right in. Do you ever get those credit card offers in the mail where it's like, spend this amount of money, you get this many entry level points, or transfer your balance now, there's 0% interest for the first 12 or 18 months. And then you like fall for it, you get the credit card, you spend the money, and then when it comes time to actually pay the bill, you're like, uh, how did I not realize that the APR and the interest rate was going to be so high? Now I'm only paying down the interest. How am I going to ever pay down this principal amount? And it's just like this quicksand of debt. Can you tell it's happened to me? It's happened to me more times than I would like to admit, actually. Well, today's sponsor, PDS Debt, has customized 0% interest options for anyone struggling with credit cards, with personal loans, with collections, or even medical bills. With rising interest rates and the cost of living at an all-time high, it can be hard to figure out how to cover everything while also paying down past debts. But now is the time to stop waiting and start saving with your own custom debt-saving options from PDS debt. So if you're making payments every single month and your debt and your balances are not going down, this program is for you. PDS Debt rolls all of your payments into one low 0% interest monthly payment so that you can save thousands in interest and fees. And get this, everyone with over $10,000 or more in debt qualifies. And there is no minimum credit score required. Both bad and fair credit are completely accepted. PDS Debt is also offering a free debt analysis to our listeners just for completing the quick and easy debt assessment at pdsdebt.com life. That's pdsdebt.com life. So take back your financial freedom today and pay off your debt in a fraction of the time by visiting pdsdebt.com life. Before we get into the updates, if you haven't watched my previous video about this case, I highly suggest you do that first so that you can get a better idea of Madalena's family, their background, and the story of her disappearance. 
The video will be linked in the description of this video, so definitely check that out, get caught up, and then come back over here. So where we last left off, Octavian Sebanu, Diana's nephew, had told the police that Diana asked him to smuggle her and Madalena away from their home because apparently her relationship with her husband Christopher was extremely harmful and she wanted to get a divorce. When police looked into Octavian's phone records, they found that he has ties to people who are involved in large-scale drug smuggling and figured that Diana may have had some ties to these people as well. On February 13th, a canine alerted for the scent of narcotics at the driver's door, but none were reported to have been found in the car at the time. However, in the console of the vehicle were several important documents, including Madalena and Diana's Moldovian and Romanian passports, Diana's Moldovian debit card, and various work and education records. So there was speculation that Diana wanted to smuggle Madalena to where family or friends could keep her safe from any harm that was going on inside of that home. Some even felt like she was making a sacrifice for her daughter by remaining in jail to keep her safe. While incarcerated, Diana was charged with possession of cocaine and fentanyl, which kind of bolsters the idea that she may have been involved in that drug trade or knew some of the people, or that she was even addicted to substances like these herself. In these newly released documents, the investigators discovered that Diana possibly lied about the last time that she saw Madalena. Originally, she told police that the last time she saw her was on November 23rd, but then in a text message on December 2nd, she told the recipient that she was with Madalena. So either Diana was lying to the recipient on the phone or lying to the police about the last time she actually saw her daughter. On December 3rd, it was discovered that Diana had stopped at a service station in a town called Hickory. She stopped there to get an oil change. The attendant said that they noticed toys in the vehicle, but that there was no child with her. On December 4th, Diana told the police that she had driven to the mountains to look for Madalena. No one really knew exactly why she would be looking in the mountains, but on December 16th, the police department in a town called Sugar Mountain provided investigators with surveillance photos of a man and a young female. The man in the images looked physically consistent in appearance to Diana's nephew Octavian, who is her only blood relative that lives in the United States. And the female in these surveillance images was physically consistent with little Madalena. In the documents, it states that the day before Diana and Christopher were arrested, a search was conducted of their home and all of the couple's electronics were seized. There was a text message found from Chris to a family member, and this text message read, We are in some kind of investigation. Maddie is missing, and the local police have taken all of our electronics. Luckily, I have an old phone, although they did not take my personal computer, probably because they overlooked it. Diana is using it now to call her parents. In addition to their cell phones, multiple thumb drives, three digital cameras, handwritten letters, bags, wallets, a planner, a desktop computer, two laptops, the family's passports, a safe, a rifle and ammo, a paper shredder with shredded paper trash, and the family's two vehicles were all taken as well. In the vehicles, they acquired receipts, a pocket knife, hairs, a scarf, a navigation system, and the car's radio and navigation displays. The documents state that they were also going to gather DNA samples for Diana and Christopher, and all of their bank records to establish activity prior to and after Madalena went missing. The investigators requested all phone call logs dating back to as far as the data is kept. They also requested geolocation information and text messages from the couple's cell phone providers. On Friday, January 6th, investigators were informed that a company called the We Handle Tech was in possession of a hard drive belonging to Christopher. They explained that they were hired by Christopher to replace the hard drive on his computer in October of 2022. The employee stated that it's their policy to keep any hard drives for one year, and they were able to give it to the Cornelius Police Department to assist in the investigation. 
The document states that the hard drive could contain documents, graphics, emails, videos, address information, text files, and deleted files that could have additional information to help in the case. Investigators also requested access by Apple to basically every piece of data under Christopher and Diana's Apple IDs, like GPS information, Find My Friends, Wi-Fi connections, digital downloads, emails, all saved passwords, and login information as well. They requested a similar warrant for Yahoo and AOL to acquire all data associated with some email addresses belonging to Chris and over 20 different email addresses belonging to Diana. Now, as we all know, all jailhouse phone calls are recorded. And during a call between Christopher, his brother, and his brother's wife, Christopher mentioned that he saw Diana with a lot of cash, but that he didn't know where it came from. He said that there is financial stuff coming up, but his brother told him not to worry about that kind of stuff right now. It kind of almost seems like his brother is thinking a little bit more rationally and what should actually be important considering Madalena is missing. Now, in one of the biggest revelations in the documents, during a call between Diana and her mother Rodica, they discussed a bag with money, withdrawing cash, and a theory that Christopher gave the girl away for money. And the girl, quote unquote, was said to be a direct quote. So I guess Diana isn't referring to her daughter by name anymore, just as the girl. And this was also seemingly the first time that Diana acknowledged that one, Christopher was involved in doing something to Madalena, and two, that she thinks that Madalena may have been sold. Now, some people have said that they believe that Diana is lying and was either directly involved with what happened to Madalena or was the one who did it herself without Chris. Either way, the fact that she believes Chris could have sold her daughter and she still is refusing to cooperate with the investigators is the most baffling thing. I can't imagine how frustrating it is for the detectives to sit in the room with these two people and just have them not say anything to help at all. Nothing. I also can't imagine Diana truly believing her daughter is in danger and not telling the police, especially now that she has been in jail for this amount of time. This sort of leads me to believe that either Diana doesn't actually think Madalena is in danger or that she was the one to put her in danger and wants to pawn the responsibility off on someone else entirely. Now, really quickly, I do want to say this because I'm sure a lot of you already have this going in your mind. You're like, hey, Annie, why haven't you mentioned this yet? We see a lot of times in cases when somebody, whether it's a parent, a spouse, anybody, refuses to identify the victim by name, that it is done in an effort to disassociate, to not feel so personally connected with the victim or with the person in this situation who is missing. So... It doesn't go unnoticed by me and I'm sure many of you that by Madalena's mother, Diana, only referring to her now as the girl, it's a sense of disconnection, a sense of disassociation, and so that there's not this personal tie, which many do believe that is the reason why she is solely responsible and trying to pawn off the responsibility now, that by her refusing to call her Madalena and simply calling her the girl at this point and disassociating from her and disconnecting from her, that that must mean and must be indicative of her being involved in Madalena's disappearance somehow and no longer wanting to connect. But what do you think of that? And I don't want to go too much into speculation, but I just know for myself as a parent, I don't think that I would ever refer to my children as when the boy went missing or when the girl went missing. I would say when my son's name went missing, when my daughter's name went missing. It just feels very detached to me at least as a parent. But what do you think? The documents state that they also decided to place an informant in Christopher's cell to gather information from him while this informant was undercover. The informant told the detectives that he saw Christopher writing almost everything down, even mundane tasks that he needed to remember to do. They gathered any and all writings from Chris on notebooks, on loose paper, sticky notes, legal documents, and even napkins, paper towels, and toilet paper. Literally, he was writing on every surface he could. These new documents that were released were over 200 pages, but what I just went over is pretty much the most important information that I was able to gather. 
However, in my opinion, the interview conducted by the creators of the Where is Madalena Kojikari Facebook page with a woman who was close to the family had just as much important information as the documents. The woman's name is Jessica, and she chose to keep her last name and place of employment private, but she is working with the police as well to answer any questions they might have and to try and help in any way she can to help find Madalena. Like I mentioned before, everyone who had the opportunity to get to know Madalena said that she was just a complete joy to be around. Jessica works at a local business in the community of Cornelius, and she said that the family would come into her work at least three times a week. These frequent visits led to her becoming very familiar and friendly with the family, and whenever they were there, Madalena would always go and find and talk to Jessica. Jessica said that she would always show Madalena pictures of her pets, her litters of kittens, and that Madalena loved to tell her all about horses and horseback riding. Jessica was asked to explain the dynamic of the family, and she said that they honestly just seemed like a normal, happy family. She said that she never noticed anything that would be considered harmful. And she actually went as far as to say that the people who believe or are saying that Diana was a victim of domestic disputes and domestic harm are incorrect. Although Jessica said that everyone did always get a really creepy vibe from Christopher. That he was like one of those guys who would kind of stare a little too long, who would awkwardly flirt with you when his wife wasn't around and just kind of had that like extra ick factor. She said that she could never exactly put her finger on it, but something about him really creeped out not just her, but all of the employees, and they would always avoid talking to him, especially if he was without Diana. Jessica was asked if she noticed any difference between Diana and Madalena's behavior when they were in the business alone versus in there with Christopher, and she said that the only thing was that they were maybe a tiny bit more quiet if he was around. If Madalena was in there with just Diana, she might be a little bit more outgoing and talkative, but it wasn't anything like she was afraid to talk in front of Christopher, maybe just a tiny bit more reserved. And I think that's a little bit normal for people to act a bit differently in front of their moms or dads when out in public, depending on who was the more strict parent. But she said in general that they were all just really nice and really normal. The only thing that wasn't typical was how Madalena was never with any friends or doing any after-school activities, besides horseback riding, which wasn't with other kids. Now, the craziest part of the interview was when Jessica described Diana and Christopher's behavior during the time that it had been discovered that Madalena was missing. Jessica said that Diana and Christopher always showed average public displays of affection, but that it was much different during the time that Madalena was gone. She said that when they started coming in without Madalena, she'd ask where Madalena was and they would always have an excuse ready. It wasn't like they had to think of what to say. They just popped out with, oh, she's at a birthday party or she's at a sleepover, which again was a little strange because Madalena had never been known to do anything like that with other kids. She also said that during this time, Christopher and Diana were acting like giddy newlyweds, holding hands, passionately kissing, and were just all over each other. And it was always initiated by Diana. She said that it was like they were on dates and that they had never seemed happier. When she found out that Madalena was actually missing during that time, it absolutely disgusted her because Diana and Christopher both acted happier than they did before. But now, Madalena was gone. So why are you so happy? She said that in her opinion, there is no way that Diana was actually a victim of any sort of domestic harm. One of the reasons she said that is because she said that she came in a lot by herself and never asked for help, saying that she could have gotten help from the police, that she could be cooperating now, but she's not. Which, I don't necessarily agree with that because there are a lot of situations of domestic disputes where even when somebody is isolated and alone, they still don't feel comfortable confiding in somebody what the situation is or acknowledging what's going on. But while she was saying all of this, she also said you'd think that if someone's daughter was missing, they'd be beside themselves, not going on dates, acting happy as can be, and making out with the person they believe had something to do with their child vanishing. Now, I just kind of want to go back once more and reiterate, just to be clear, I know that all sorts of victims of DV can act all different sorts of ways. They don't always reach out for help. And there are also situations, too, of trauma bonding and things like that, where 
you go through a traumatic event and you feel closer to that person after that. So this is just Jessica's opinion and what she believes based on the things that she saw and their behavior. Neighbors also noticed that during this time, Diana even decorated the house for Christmas, which not really sure who decorates for the holidays when their child is missing or could have potentially been sold. Maybe it's in an effort to welcome them back when they do arrive home. You're holding out hope that they'll return home and you want the house to be perfect and warm and inviting. There's something in this whole case that disconnects for me a little bit. Jessica, as well as other people who knew the couple, said that Diana was actually the one who wore the pants in the relationship. And I think that since Diana's father said in his interview that Christopher was controlling over her and controlling over her talking to her family, many people just went with that and believed that Diana was a controlled woman who couldn't get out. But to people who are around them frequently and regularly, Christopher apparently was the soft-spoken one, the one who followed Diana's lead. And it just appeared like she was the more dominant of the two to people who knew them. The only thing Jessica and others can't grapple with is that it does appear that Diana had something to do with Madalena's disappearance, or at the very least, knows where she is. But it's so confusing because Diana seemed super loving toward her daughter. Everyone said that she was nurturing, affectionate, would get all of Madalena's favorite little candies to make her happy, and Madalena never seemed disheveled, dirty, hungry, harmed, or anything like that. So how could this happen? How does a family end up in a situation like this when it's obvious that Madalena wasn't just taken by a stranger? And then in one final bizarre piece of the interview that I picked up on, Jessica was asked if there were any sightings of Christopher around Cornelius during the time that he claimed to have been in Michigan. And she said that she wasn't able to talk about that. Now, I think if the answer was no, she would have either just said no or I don't know. So why would she say I'm not able to talk about that? She is working with the police. So is that something that they have a lead on but can't be publicly acknowledged? So did Christopher not even actually go to Michigan? And if not, could he and Diana have done something to Madalena together? Like drop her off with Octavian or some other person with nefarious intentions? And then maybe they lied about Christopher being in Michigan as some way to throw off the police. Who knows? There still is just so much that doesn't make any sense in this case. There was what seemed like one other major tip that came in from a woman in California. She claimed to have been driving through a very small town called Weaverville. And she apparently spotted a young girl there who asked for a ride up north. She had said that she had seen a missing persons poster of Madalena and that this little girl was holding a little disheveled kitten and looked just like her. The police followed up on this tip and many people were hopeful that Madalena was out there in the company of a kitten and could be found alive. However, the Cornelius Police Department came out with a statement on July 20th, which read, We want to make sure accurate information is being reported to the public in regard to when Madalena was last seen. As we have always reported, Madalena was last seen getting off of her school bus on November 21st, 2022. Throughout this investigation, we have received numerous tips on possible sightings of Madalena in various locations across the country. All tips were thoroughly investigated and determined not to be Madalena. We will continue to follow up on any tips or possible sightings of Madalena. We want to bring Madalena home. This has been our priority since we learned she was missing. Please continue to share her picture on social media to help us find Madalena. So this post actually has a lot of people confused. Are they only referring to recent call-in tips not being Madalena? Or are they also referring to the sighting mentioned in the court documents of what seemed to be Madalena and Octavian in Sugar Mountain? It just seems like too much of a coincidence that people who look exactly like Madalena and Octavian just happened to be in that same place that Diana was looking for her. But I don't know. Stranger things have happened. Even without this new document, there are many theories that people who are following this case have come up with as possibilities. Did a complete stranger just take Madalena? Was there an accident that took place in the house and then either Christopher, Diana, or both of them panicked? Do either one of them know more? 
If it turns out that Christopher was actually physically harmful, is it possible that he took something too far? Some people have speculated that Christopher got Diana hooked on substances and that they owed a debt or just wanted to make a deal with some smuggling ring and Diana was so strung out that she didn't even care anymore. But even if that's the case, if she ever did actually love Madalena, after sitting in jail and sobering up for several, several months now, you'd think that she would confess to try to at least have a chance at Madalena being saved, right? I don't know. What do you guys think about this case? What do you think all this new information points to? I want to know what you guys think, so let me know in the comments. I'm interested to find out what the investigators end up finding on Diana, Christopher, and Octavian's phone records, their location data, and especially their hard drives. Especially since Chris recently had that hard drive replaced. I mean, there's no telling what is on that. Also, why would Diana even mention trafficking as a possibility to her mom? Trafficking is a global abomination that really thrives in the shadows, but it doesn't only happen in the dark corners of the world. It happens everywhere. There is a distinction between trafficking and smuggling. For example, when someone is smuggling substances, they are simply moving the substance, like hiding them under clothes at the airport or secretly packing them in shipping crates to transport to another country, something like that. Trafficking, however, would be the movement and then the actual sale of the substances. The same is true for people, with most human smuggling taking place consensually in order to secretly or illegally get a person from one place to another. Human trafficking, however, on the other hand, is merciless modern-day slavery. The objective is to exploit victims, whether it be for money or some other gain. It's something that is finally being openly discussed or starting to be openly discussed and not hushed to pretend like these things don't actually happen. While authorities have not linked Madalena's case to human trafficking, we do know one of the investigators listed on the search warrant is a state agent who investigates this crime. Sometimes, like you said, they're hidden in plain sight. Tuesday afternoon, I spoke with the board president for the Charlotte Metro Human Trafficking Task Force. Between 30 and 50 percent of all human trafficking actually happens at the hands of family members. Wow. When we see family members who are trafficking their children, the children often tend to be much younger, generally under the age of 12. Shauna Pagano says human trafficking is a real issue everywhere, but made worse in Mecklenburg County because of our geography and having two major interstates, I-85 and I-77, going right through the area. Traffickers will take victims and they'll transport them along major interstates to big cities where they can then sell their victims, where they know that they'll essentially have a demand to meet the supply. Pagano adds in just the last three years, a study she was involved in identified 170 minors as trafficking victims in Mecklenburg County alone. Do you might notice that something just seems off? Perhaps it's a child that doesn't look like, you know, they're comfortable with the person or they're, maybe there's signs of abuse. She says if you notice something questionable like that, you can go ahead and call the National Human Trafficking Hotline. Of course, it's a, if it's an emergency, go ahead and just call 911. Which I pray that Madalena isn't suffering in this way at all and that she really is just somewhere safe for some crazy, bizarre reason that none of us understand. A reason maybe that Diana thinks is too serious for even the FBI to help out with. I don't know. I hope that Christopher or Diana will cooperate in this investigation moving forward so that Madalena gets every bit of justice that she deserves if something did happen to her, or if there's any hope that she can be found. So please let me know what you guys think is going on here, and I will keep you updated on anything else that comes out about this case, because these documents are getting unsealed, interviews are happening, and we're finally starting to piece together some more of this crazy puzzle of what happened to Madalena. So take a quick second, please hit that subscribe button. It's absolutely free, but that way you will be notified of case updates when I post them for Madalena's case and for other true crime stories. 
All right, guys, thanks so much for tuning in today. Please share this video anywhere you can on your social media, your group chat thread, anywhere, because the more eyes we get on Madalena's case and on her photo and on her missing persons flyer, the more likely that a tip will come through, that a sighting may have occurred. So it's so important that her story get shared because we are now coming up on a year of her being missing or last being seen, I should say. So please share this everywhere you can. All right, guys, until the next one, stay safe. Bye.